Today on Real Ghost Stories Online, a woman recounts the traumatic life she leads with her husband who has been followed by a demon since the age of two. And how did a hospice patient get a message from loved ones from beyond the grave? Also, a family makes a grisly discovery on a family vacation. Welcome to Real Ghost Stories Online. Call in your real ghost story now at 855-853-4802 or write in at realghoststoriesonline.com. You are about to enter the world of the unknown and quite possibly the undead. This is Real Ghost Stories Online. Yep, 855-853-4802. The phone number to call in and share your Real Ghost Story with us. Right on the website, realghoststoriesonline.com. And if you want access to some of our best stories ever, we put a brand new episode out every single week. It's called our EPP bonus episode. Extra podcast person. That's what EPP stands for. You get that at ghostpodcast.com. As well as access to all of our episodes weeks in advance of their normal release and they're commercial free and get those at ghost podcast as well for five bucks a month get access to all of it when you sign up or patreon you can do it there too if you like that platform patreon.com slash real ghost stories tony and carol hughes joining you once again and how are you this fine day i'm good i got i got invited to something that's invited to what I got invited to something that surprised me. Okay. Like something I didn't think I would get invited to. Okay. <laughs> Randomly, the other day, my friend says, hey, do you want to come to a seance? <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't like, get that once a week? No. Not just no, but F no. And um, <laughs> I'm like, there's no way. Like, I no. <laughs> and apparently, they had company from out of the country and uh, at his mom's house. And so they're from Germany and they come to the house and they're like, you have five spirits living in this house. And Sunday night we are having a seance (laughs) and we're getting more information on it. So that's what I got invited to. So yesterday I'm texting him and I'm like, so what time is your seance? Like I need a recap of this seance. And I think everybody chickened out except the woman who wanted to do it. And everybody else chickened out about the seance. Do you have to have multiple people involved for the seance, or can the one woman just just do it herself? No. I think it sounds like, because my friend said, I texted him today. um, He said, so there was a lot of discussion followed by my mom and stepdad changing the subject and laughing about something unrelated. So I think... I'm going to schedule one with my aunt only. So he said just the two of them. I'm like, oh, my God. So your friend really wants to do the seance. He does. Oh. He's got a bunch of stories. We have to have him on sometime. Okay. He's good at storytelling anyway. But, um, yeah, like, I guess when a German comes to town and they're like, hey, <laughs> I'm not going to try to do a German accent because it sounds really bad when I do it. But they're like, hey, haunted house, let's do a seance. I guess everybody at first says, yeah, let's make the Germans happy. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first thing I it think of. Down to it, <laughs> nobody can do it. Wow. I, I've always, uh, you know, that that's my first concern usually when I go into a German restaurant is I'm going to get the schnitzel and they'll probably want to do a seance <laughs> in between courses. And it's like, uh, I think I might just go to the Italian one next door. I feel a little safe. Because they don't demand on seances <laughs> and they get free garlic knots. It's just like not at all what you'd expect. <laughs> I know. It's like, what? It was so funny because he's like, do you want to go to a seance? No, <laughs> not at all. I was wondering, like, like, you might as well ask me to get out the Ouija board. That's how much interest I have in that. It'd be great if it came in, like, nice little, like, envelopes and, and you know, calligraphy letters. <laughs> like, are They're you- like, oh, my God, I've been invited to a wedding. Oh, no. It's a seance. It's a seance. <laughs> Same font, though, as a wedding. <laughs> Great way to use, like, wedding invites that you have extras of. Just uh, use it right. for the seance later on. In that beautiful font. <laughs> and you're just so lovely. <laughs> well, there you go. Well, I'm uh, I'm glad your friend is going to find a way to have the seance. I'm looking forward to hearing what happens when they actually yeah, do pull it Yeah, because the Germans off. can't be here forever. Yeah. So if he's going to do it, they have to get on it. Got to get to it. Yep. 
Well, but ma- I just, I'm like, I just don't want to. What is the I, goal here the with the seance? Kind of freaks me out. With the Germans that are staying, or, or do they want to like, would the seance help these folks cross over? Or do they just want to have them over for a little America's Funniest Home Video and pizza on a Sunday night? <laughs> I don't really know. I think that the woman who wants to have the seance is obviously somebody who connects to that, mm-hmm. and so I think she wants more information on who's there. Okay. And so she was saying, like, one of them's a grandfatherly type or fatherly type of person. and But she said there's five different spirits in the house. She's already got that figured out. Um, but I'm like, if you're that in tune, do you really even have to have the seance? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of take it from, like, standard definition to high definition when you have the seance. Or is, are you going to get more info with the seance? I don't know. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a seance maker. So. Yeah, me either. So I... <laughs> And I don't want to be. Yeah. Like, because I'm like, what if they, like, stir up something and no. then it's like, you know, I'd really like to live with that girl. Oh, they can stir it up and go back to Germany. And who's ever in that house, they get the uh, the new and improved ghosts. So. Right. I don't know. It's a door and I would not want And can they follow out. me home? I mean. Potentially. I mean, it depends cool. how many frequent flyer miles they have. Um, but, you know, we don't know that until. Because I'm pretty show. nice and fun. And they'd mm-hmm. be like, I want to live at her house. No. Great. Not something I think I'd want to uh, be doing, uh, just in case. Kind of falls in that Ouija awareness month thing, where it's exactly. like, yeah, not not going to mess with it. And really, every month is Ouija board awareness. It month. is. It, it truly is. We just always got to, you know, be vigilant. So, wow. Well, that's exciting. Uh, let's go to our first story. 855-853-4802 is our number at Real Ghost Stories Online. First one, uh, it says, I have many ghost stories, but let me tell a story that's been so uh, vividly Uh, told to me Uh, just recently I've experienced it myself I believe entities follow you or attaching them to you or your loved ones my husband has a presence about himself that you want to know him very charismatic you would never guess that he has a demonic spirit that has followed him since the age of two One of the first stories that were told to me when we first started dating, I would have been scared off if I hadn't been surrounded by the unknown my whole life and very sensitive to those things as well, was when he was two years old, he was in his crib. There was an older man in a black trench coat and a tall black hat standing over the crib. He would just stare at him like they were waiting for him. After that experience, he remembers seeing a dead person lying beside his bed when he was four. His mother said that he'd go into such detail, something a child would never know. He even told him what it smelled like. They took him to a psychiatrist to see what was wrong. He didn't feel like anything was wrong. In fact, he felt at ease with the man in the black hat in the room. So fast forward to the first month we lived together. I remember lying there, looking up at the ceiling. Suddenly, I felt something was in the room. I sat up and looked around. Nothing. All of a sudden, something moved towards me and seemed to just go right through me. Oddly enough, that didn't faze me at all. A few minutes pass, and as I'm about to fall back to sleep, then I felt someone jump on top of me and hold me down. I felt like I was screaming for help, and nothing was around me. My husband was no longer in the room with, with me, and I was alone. And suddenly I woke up. I'm not sure if I was asleep or not, and my husband was yelling at me. I looked up at him, and he said that I wasn't breathing and seemed to be choking. It seemed to stop hurting me as soon as my husband started yelling and shaking me. Another time he actually saw me get pulled to the ground. Again, I couldn't speak until I hit the ground. I screamed, of course, as soon as he picked me up. I didn't feel gloom and doom anymore. I don't know if this thing is an angry being or demonic. All I know, if my husband has a discerning spirit around him, and all uneasiness goes away when I am near him. So every once in a while I feel it in the room and I simply scoot next to him and the dark thing and the dark feeling simply disappears oh that's that's really interesting with the fact that the entity seems to be attached to the husband but he's also kind of the elixir to this that that makes things calm down for her yeah i'm i have to think about that because it's almost like now the thing's attached to her it's like it jumped yeah yeah like it went to her and that she feels safe from him, with him, to protect her from that. So is it really following him or her? It's almost like, is it, is it like a jealousy thing where it's 
doesn't like her, but then if you get real close to the other, like a pet, or like an animal that has like a real strong attachment to someone that really is always trying to push the other person away. But if you get really close to that person that it loves, it'll be nice to you because it doesn't want to harm the individual that it loves because you're you, then you're too close to do anything to. That, that's the only kind of analogy I can think of. Yeah, I don't like that. I And, you know, he must be a pretty nice guy because if that was me, deal breaker. <laughs> yeah. Like, I would have to break up. If, you know, you might as well smoke. I'm sorry, every, with all respect to people who smoke. <laughs> deal breaker for me. But I just don't think I could. That would be really difficult. Especially, like. You're just watching TV, sitting in your comfy chair, and then it's like, ooh, here it is. I got to go snuggle up with my husband to get it to go away. It does it, and it comes around someone he's not there, I wonder. Or is he always there when it happens? I don't know. I mean, it sounds like he was in the other room in the example that was given, because then he came back. But yeah. but I wonder if, if it, it happens when he's literally out of the house and she's alone. That's yeah. a good question. Uh, I don't know. I mean, if if he's gone and out of the house and it's hanging around, I would say it's 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 migrated more to her than than to him. Yeah, and it could be both of them. He just doesn't feel it anymore. He's gotten so used to it. Yeah, it'd have been an odd uh, odd conversation at the first date. Where oh yeah, great. What do you like? A uh, bowling. You know, I like to sometimes go hiking too. That's fun. Oh, uh, I have a demon that's uh, been attached to me since I was two when I was like, in the crib. I saw dead people all well, the time. Do you like uh, sweet tea? How did they decide it was a <laughs> demon though? I'm, I mean, what it did was pretty mean to her, but yeah. not necessarily demonic. Well, uh, she says at the end of it, I'm not sure if it's a demon or just kind of an angry, yeah. possessive type thing. I think it, probably the assumption goes to demon. And maybe early on, that's what you're going to think, because it doesn't seem very friendly. But I, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to say if it is a demon or just some sort of real jealous type possessive entity. That's kind of what I'm you're getting out of it. Tanya, if your kid at two something's going on i would never tell that kid i think you have a demon following you like i don't know what age you would tell him that fourth grade <laughs> is usually the acceptable age to tell the child you have a demon following you i mean we all <laughs> that, fourth fourth grade that's usually <laughs> you sit down i mean remember that in school there was like the fourth grade you have a demon following you class and it was either you do or you don't <laughs> It was, um, I believe, right after we learned about uh, presidents. Sex. Yeah. Oh, presidents. Yeah, presidents. It was presidents and then demons. It was. <laughs> it's like, all right, the oh, presidents' names, funny. you memorize all those. And then it was the demon members. It was like Beelzebub. And there was like a fun song for it, too. I believe. And then everybody looks at you. Oh, Tony. Yeah. You have the demon. I just would have a really hard time. I mean, I can't even go to the damn seance. I'd have a really hard time. That's literally inviting it into your home when you get married to a guy mm -hmm. who's got a demon following him. attached to him. It is. It That'd very much hard. is. That'd be hard. She must <laughs> love him. He must be a pretty great guy. I, it's probably a Rose and uh, Jack type relationship, I'm thinking. That's going on there, probably. 855-853-4802 uh, is our phone number at Real Ghost Stories Online. Next story says, this is Courtney. I've written a few times to share some stories. I recently listened to an episode that reminded me of another one. I didn't directly have an experience with all of these occurrences, but I know the stories well. Back around 2000 or 2001, my grandma, my stepdad's mother, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. My parents were sort of expecting that diagnosis. When they go visit her, she'd have many cans of Diet Coke in her refrigerator. She'd always forget things, and she tried to cook a pizza on the stovetop with plastic wraps all over it. And that was when my stepdad decided that she was a potential danger to herself and looked into home options for her. My parents did a lot of research to find the best place for her, and they found a lady's home, probably about 15 minutes or so from our house. We got her moved in and met all the caretakers. My mom and I decided that we would volunteer there a few nights a week. One night would be game night or craft night during the week. Some Saturdays we'd go in and paint their fingernails or help cheer them up and make them feel like they were getting a spa treatment. I was 11 at this time, and I wasn't the biggest girly girl, so painting nails was not my forte, but I did my best, and the ladies never seemed to mind. They loved talking to us and uh, uh, telling us old antidotes from years past. I always loved hearing them. 
volunteering was also a great way for us to spend time with my grandma every week and check in to see how she was doing. I'll admit I was never overly close with this grandmother, but watching her go through the motions of losing her memories made me sad. I'd like to think I would make anyone sad. There were some moments when we got a chuckle out of some of the stuff she said, like the time when she said she hated it when my stepdad used to pistol whip him, which never happened. But some things even now give us pause. The home was strictly a ladies' home, meaning men weren't allowed to be residents. The hallways were all lined with couches and chairs, so the residents didn't have to feel cooped up in their rooms all the time. And so visiting family members could sit out there and talk with them for a while. My mom and grandma were sitting out on one of the couches one day, and my mom said that my grandma kept looking down the hallway, would get an indignant look on her face and then look away. This happened a few times before my mom finally asked, Opal, what's wrong? My grandma replied, who's that man down there? My mom looked down the hallway, but the only person sitting out there was a woman near the end of the hall, and she had no visitors. My mom looked back to my grandma and said, there aren't any men down there. Still indignant, my grandma said, well, whoever they are, they need to quit playing with themselves. I should explain that this was something very out of character for her to say. She wasn't a crude woman, was always polite and rarely ever seemed to get angry about anything. My mom was surprised by her saying this and looked down the hall again just to make sure. But there was still just the older woman. Looking back, I'm wondering if something was there that my mom just couldn't see. It was only a few months after that that she took a turn for the worse. They moved to the hospice care. And at the time, I didn't understand what that meant. But I remember seeing one of the other ladies from the home there as well and was glad that my grandma at least had a friend there with her. My family was all crowded in her room and I took a spot at the bottom of the bed. She kept staring at the wall behind me and smiling. And when one of my aunts asked what she was looking at, she said that her mama and daddy were there waiting to take her home. I got a chill and wanted to move immediately from my spot, especially since the room got quiet as everyone took this in. The statement caused some tears to be shed, which was understandable. Those were some of the last words she ever spoke. The final ones being, I love you too, to my mom. Her kids kept telling her that it was okay to go, and they loved her, but she was hanging on for something, someone. My brother was in the Navy at the time and had been given leave to be there with us during this time. He arrived late on the night of September 19th to say goodbye to her, and she passed away around 4 in the morning on September 20th, which was my sister's birthday. During my time at the ladies' home, I'd gotten to know her better and was taking the loss very hard. It was my first experience with death. After we laid her to rest, we worked on getting her things from her room at the ladies' home. My grandma had these powder perfume jars that my mom said I could have. I opened them and smelled them, deciding that they smelled nice, but I likely wouldn't use them and took them home with me anyway. I stored them underneath my bathroom sink where they stayed for a long time since I keep things for sentimental reasons sometimes. Anyways, a few months after her passing, I was in my bathroom and smelled the faint scent of the powdered perfume. It didn't dawn on me right away that that was the source of the smell, but after doing some investigating, I looked under my sink and saw the jars. They'd been undisturbed the entire time I'd had them under there. But I pulled one out and unscrewed the cap and smelled it again. Sure enough, it's what I'd smelled moments ago. I was confused as to why I'd smelled it again out of the blue. Why? Or was it my grandma checking in? For a while, I wasn't inclined to believe this since I was never close to her until the end, but maybe she always loved me more than I realized. I guess I'll never know. I never smelled the perfume powder after that, and many years later, I finally cleaned it out of my vanity. I still don't know if it was her, but I don't really believe there are coincidences. Casey, could you... No, that's it. Um, but that's a, that, that's, it's a special one where you get the scent that comes back to, to let you know that the person's there. And that one kind of has is a multi-part thing. Mm-hmm. When she was at, which I love, they call it the ladies' home. I think it sounds like a more special place to go. A place so for like mom. A old folks' home or nursing home. The ladies' home sounded very pleasant. But um, when she was there and saw the man at the end of the hall, probably was she was seeing things. Mm-hmm. Because I worked in a nursing home, and that's really common. Sure. That they see things that aren't there. Now, in the hospice... That I do believe. Like, 
I've just heard so many stories of people, you know, at the end of life, seeing someone Mm -hmm. there. So I believe that. Yeah. And I also believe that that smell was her grandmother. And I also think it was really sweet that she got close with her grandmother when her grandmother really needed her. And I think that's really special. Yeah, it was. Glad she had that experience. They, there was the time that was still there to to make that relationship a reality, and and she took it. So that's a good thing on both parts. Yeah, and, and I, I agree. There's there's a lot of times where in the nursing care facilities they do see things that are not there. In the hospice areas where it gets really interesting, especially when they start conveying information sometimes that they should have no knowledge of. Um, that, that suddenly comes out, which does happen sometimes. And then you wonder, well, maybe they're not just seeing things. Maybe there really is someone coming over. Well, Remember- and we had a friend and I don't want to use his name, mm-hmm. <clears throat> but he died of cancer Yeah, and we worked with him mm-hmm. and he was in hospice Yeah, and while he was, he was really, really sick at the end of his life and they lost their dog. And I think they told him about it, but he was kind of in and out. And so at the very, very end, he was looking at the floor and at the ground. He's like, hey, I can't remember the dog's name. Yeah. But it's like, jump up here. Come here and see me. And he was talking to the dog. I didn't and know that. And the dog had just passed. Yeah. And so they literally went to the um, gift shop and got him a dog stuffed animal. Yeah. So he could hold it. And he really thought he was holding the dog but he saw the dog in the room that had just passed yeah and he was right at the the last stages i didn't yeah, i didn't that know was that maybe story a day or two before wow yeah so i really do believe those things happen at the end i think yeah. that line between what where we are and where they are mm-hmm. totally gets blurred and i mean obviously it has to Sure. Yeah, I agree. I remember my my grandmother when she was not in hospice yet, but it was a couple months before she got there. I was visiting her, and she was really telling me about all the sailboats that were going past her window every day. She was not by any body of water, uh, but uh, she thought, and you just go along with it, you know, because uh-huh. it's your mind; it's firing incorrectly and i believe that's that's kind of what's going on at that point but the hospice time that's you know at the end then there I, I don't remember the specifics my mom could probably fill that in but I, I know there was some things where she was talking about very specific people who were in the room um that she had not been talking about previously um and it got got rather interesting uh, but yeah, that's, that happens quite frequently. I love when we get stories from hospice nurses and such, because there's, there's so many interesting, um, interesting stories. I think if there's ever a career you want to get into, uh, if you don't believe in ghosts or the paranormal or things like this happening, uh, and want it to be proven to you, yeah. uh, even above paranormal investigator would be hospice employee of some sort where you have to interact with the folks. I think that give it a month. You may, you're going to walk out of that job going, okay, I believe there's no way to explain half of this stuff um, with, with what goes on. Uh, eight, five. I imagine yeah. they've all had experiences. Yeah. They, every, every last one of them. I'm, I'm sure. And that work is so tough, but man, I appreciate what they do. Yeah, it, it is. It, it, you know, it, it's tough. You know, it, it, it probably tears you apart. It's rewarding. It's like, it's so many damn emotions at once. Right. It, it takes the right type of individual to, to be able to process it, though, I think, and not not let it pull them down with the, the sadness part of it. But uh, 855-853-4802 is our phone number. Let's go to another story. It says, last summer, my stepdad and I went to this one dirt biking pit called Walker Valley in Washington State. When we got there, it was a Wednesday morning, and there weren't that many people around at all, except for a few bikers here and there. Turns out that my stepdad and I were the only ones using the main dirt path. I guess it wasn't very busy that day. My dad and I were riding our dirt bike up and down these small dirt hills, and he was a few feet ahead of me. As I was following him, my bike started slowing down, and the engine was sputtering. I kept on twisting the throttle handle, but it wouldn't speed up. Suddenly, my bike came to a complete stop, and I had to pull over to the side. My stepdad didn't stop or even look around because I guess he either didn't know that I had stopped or he didn't want to wait for me. So I was alone. I used a kickstart and my bike sputtered again, but it wouldn't start up. 
I kickstarted it again, and this time I noticed that there was a really weird smell coming from the tailpipe. This was a really dark colored smoke every time I tried to start it. I looked into the tailpipe thinking there was something in there, but it was perfectly clear. So I kickstarted my bike a few times again, and finally it started. I caught up with my dad, and we rode around for a few more hours, but my bike kept on acting strange and even came to a stop one more time. Later in the afternoon, we left Walker Valley and headed home. When we got home, my dad went inside to use the bathroom while I was taking my bike down from the back of the truck. I pulled it into the garage and stay, uh, started giving it a full inspection because I wanted to see what was wrong with it. When I opened the side hood to look into the engine, I was shocked and disgusted at what I saw. There was thick brown hair entangled all over the engine. There were some smoke and nasty burning smells coming from it. I was really surprised because before we left for the park, I looked at the engine. There was no hair at all. And as I was staring at this hair, it looked like it had really wound itself up and they're pretty good. This was obviously what had been causing my bike trouble. I picked it out and I was really disgusted. It took me like 20 minutes to get it all out. After I got all the burnt hair out, I threw it away in the trash. I then went inside and asked my mom if she knew anything about the hair. Her hair was almost the same color as the ones on my bike. She looked at me weird and said that she hadn't been near it. Besides, her hair is short like a guy's. I was tired, took a long nap in my room. When I woke up, it was night, so I wanted to take a shower before I went back to sleep. When I went in the shower, I started washing my hair, and as I was rinsing my hair out, I looked down and saw some long brown hair sticking out of the drainage hole, and some of it was on my feet and tangled in my toes. I screamed out loud, and I almost slipped. Got out of the shower really fast and ran out of there and into my room naked, wet and shivering. I was so scared. It couldn't possibly be my hair because I'm blonde and my stepdad is bald. My mom came running up the stairs and asked me what was wrong. I said nothing. I just went to bed and tried to sleep. Next morning, I cautiously went into the bathroom and looked in the tub. The hair was gone. I've never told anybody except for now what I have written into your show. I still can't explain exactly what happened. Unfortunately, it has not happened again. I'm still kind of scared to take a shower. Do you blame me? Hopefully, I'll be able to get over with what happened and move on. That sounds horrific. Yeah, that was creepy. I, like, I, and how did the hair even wind up on his bike? Yeah, you just, I mean, at first you're thinking, at least I was thinking, well, maybe an animal. Like, maybe you hit an animal of some sort, didn't realize it, and it's fur, not hair. But hair and fur are very distinctive, and most animals don't grow their fur out to any sort of 80s rockerish style, which I'm kind of envisioning into the, uh, on, under the bike. I mean, there's, there's a couple rabbits every now and then that are known to really get into that whole Def Leppard look, but it's, it's few and far <laughs> between. Um, yeah, so it's, running into one of those, that would yeah. happen. You, you, ever, you see them every now and then, and it's like, you, yeah, it, you just know, and they're, you know, you know, anyway, they, they, they're they kind of bobbing their heads a little bit. They're like, hysteria. It's like, you're a rabbit. What are you doing? Um, but yeah, it's just the idea of the hair tangled up. That's creepy in itself. And you don't really know why. But then to be in the shower. Anytime I think anything strange happens in the shower is just, you know, it, it's going to take a lot to kind of make you feel comfortable again. Unexplained noises out there. You're if in a very shatter. vulnerable yeah. position. It's the worst place to have really something happen. It in, you're soaking wet. Yeah. And then to have hair falling down that's not yours. I remember the day that all my hair fell out. Just, just in, when I, I just lost it all just in the shower one day. And it was kind of traumatic. But I was like, all right, I'm bald now. It was just like that, gone. But... Um, I know, and the 80s hair that you had at the time was so amazing. I had the best mullet ever. It was... Oh, God. Permed. I, I know. I and every day I would perm it, and I would, it was it was great. I loved it. Um, but uh, that would just be. I, I don't know. I don't know that I would ever feel comfortable in the shower again, or washing my hair for that matter. I think I just shaved my head at that point. The crazy thing is, is like there are things that I've never really thought about before, and that's one of them. <laughs> yeah. And now, yeah. like if I have a strange, unexplained hair on my hand or foot i'm gonna freak out there you go next time you're taking a shower millions of them oh god that'd be so gross so like just all of a sudden you're just wrapped up in somebody's hair 
for no reason. The thing is, here's what's going on right now. There, I'm going to get an email because there's at least probably one person listening to this while in the shower hearing this story. <laughs> and they're going to be like, I had to take, turn it off. I had shampoo in my eyes. Fuck you. I, you know. So I'm sorry um, that we caught you at that moment. I'll just say that. Um, but shit happens. So there you go. That, that's, that's, that's a nightmare. Oh, and look at your feet. They're covered in hair. And it's not yours. <laughs> Have a great work day. Uh, 855-853-4802 <laughs> is our number at Real Ghost Stories Online. Let's go to a caller. Hi, you're on the air. Hey, how you doing, Tony? Hey, this is uh, Dave Vaughn again, uh, out of Virginia Beach, uh, Gene. Uh, I called, uh, I called, uh, I called you, uh, maybe a couple weeks ago, gave you two little short stories about what happened when I was a kid. Now, the story I'm about to tell you here is actually about my son. He was younger. Uh, well, he's my, uh, my half to my son, you know, for my, my previous marriage, my, my previous marriage. So anyway, so this is the crazy thing about this story, all right? This is during the time, the reason why I bring this up, this is during the time that movie The Ring came out on DVD. So me and my ex-wife, we had our first apartment. So I was in the military, we had our first apartment. And to give you the outline of the house, I want to give you the outline of the house. When you first walk through the, 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 the when you first walk in the house, you got the living room right there. And when you go past the living room, there's a little, there's a hallway of this apartment. And on the left-hand side, is, on the left-hand side going down the hallway is the, the bathroom. And when you go down the further down the hallway towards the end on the right on, on the right side is our bedroom. And in front and in front of the end of the hallway going straight will be the kids' bedroom. It'll be my son Brian and my little son Ezra. Brian at that time was about I said he was about maybe five years old, four or five years old, which makes Ezra about three. And the way the room is set up over there is when you walk through his room on the on, when you go to when you walk straight through his, in his room, on the right hand side will be Israel's bed, and it's like against the wall, uh, vertical status, uh, against the wall, and it's like the little kids' bed. And then you go further in the room, against that wall on the left hand side, and far left hand side will be Brian's uh, Brian's bed, and his bed with it with the headboard will be on against the wall on the left, and the footboard of course will be on the right facing towards Israel's way. And right next to Brian will be the, the shelter where we have the lamp on. Well, so uh, I'll get back to that in a second. But uh, so me and my, me and my ex-wife was watching, me and my ex-wife my wife was watching the ring. Now, I had some scary stuff happen when I was young, when I was younger. And, I, I, you know, my mother's road church going, and we, didn't, we lived actually by a cemetery one time, and we didn't see things through that. You know, I wasn't really, I was never really scared. So my father, you know, we always watched scary movies like Exodus when it first came out and things like The Gates of Hell. So I really wasn't scared of things. Kids always freaked me out because kids would get you to a scary thing, right? But I, you know, never, I was getting older. So things didn't really, and never happened to me since I was younger. So anyway, we watching The Ring. We finished watching The Ring and there's a part in The Ring where it said, on the DVD, where it says, watch me or don't watch me. So, of course, we ain't put the don't watch me part. We said, watch me. We said, watch me, and it does that little ring thing, and it takes the ring, and it takes the watch it, and then things happen. Well, uh, what happened was, uh, as soon as you finish watching, I turn the sucker off, and here's the crazy part. And about two minutes later, our phone rings. And we're like, what the heck? And it was late at night. It had to be like maybe 12 or 1. So I pick up the phone, and all you hear is snow. And I'm like, what the heck? Hello? Hello? And you just hear the snow. I said, we're trying to talk, but there's the snow. So I got y'all. Heck, nah, man. It is. I tripped it. I tripped it. So I hang up the phone. My, my, my wife, my wife, she goes, well, I'm going to go check on the kids and make sure, every, you know, make sure everything's good, right? She goes and checks on them. I'm still in the living room, nothing to DVD or whatever. And she goes, she came back in the living room, like, shocked. And I'm like, what's wrong? And she's like, babe. I'm like, what? She's like, Brian, he's just sitting up in the bed. I was like, oh, okay. She's like, yeah, I'm telling him to lay down. He ain't listening. I said, you mean he ain't listening? I said, tell him to lay down and go back to sleep. And she's like, I done told him to go back. He's not listening. He's looking straight at the wall. I said, what you mean looking straight at the wall? She's like, she like and when I talk to him, he's not even looking at me. But I know his eyes are open. It's dark. I can see his eyes. They're open. And I'm going to like, I said, huh? And she's like, 
you, you need to see what's going on. I said, I ain't going in there. <laughs> He's like, baby, you got to go. I was like, come on, man. Why every time the guy got to go? Like, man, so I'm going to Israel. I go to the room. And I see him sitting up. Israel is dead sleep. I'm over there screaming at Brian. 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 He don't even look at me. And usually when I say something with a certain verse in voice, he knows you better listen to what I'm saying. I said, Brian. He didn't look at me at all. Brian Israel didn't even hear him. I'm surprised he ain't waking up this whole time. All this stuff about to go on, he ain't even coming at all. And I'm like, man, I'm like, hey, man, this is freaking me out. And she's like, Man, what's going on? I'm scared. I'm like, God, lay down. Brian, lay down. What I say? He ain't freaking moving. He's not even turning his head. He looks straight at the wall. And I'm trying to hit the, the light switch, which is right at, when you get to the door, it's right at the left. So hit the light switch. But the problem is, at the left, right at the left to come on, you got to already have that little string you pull on the lamp. It's got to already be pulled. So when you do the switch, it goes off to whatever it is, comes on. Well, the switch wasn't pulled, so which means you got to hit the light switch and then go over there and then pull the, pull the string for the lamp. So I mean, I got to get close to Brian to pull this dog on light. So anyway, so I'm calling him, Brian, Brian, he ain't listen. So I'm creeping up against the wall, going towards the Chester to get ready to turn his lamp on. And I'm like, Brian, he ain't listen. So I keep seeing him, looking dead at him. And I can see his eyes open, looking straight up the wall towards Israel. And I'm like, and he's sitting up, and I'm like, I said, boy, I'm going to tear your butt up if you don't listen to what I'm telling you. You better lay down and sleep. He's not, he not turning. He's not looking at me. So I'm a little freaked out, you know. So I get towards the light. I get towards the Chester. Call him and whisper, Brian, Brian, to get closer. Because now he's right there by the Chester. When I reach up, and I swear to God, when I reach up and I go, Brian, and he don't look at me again, as soon as I hit the light switch, I mean, as soon as I hit the light switch, his head snaps towards me. He goes, I had a bad dream. And he just, his eyes, he just pours rain. Like, he just pours crying. And he's, he's going crazy. He, when he snaps towards it, I jump back. I hit the floor. My ex-wife just took off running. I was like, oh, my God. So he's just going, he's going crazy. I grab him and hug him and stuff like that. And I'm like, it's okay, it's okay. And then, you know, I stayed with him. And, I, you know, I, you know, when we went to sleep, and he went to sleep and stuff like that. And I'm like, the next day, the next morning, I asked Brian. I said, uh, Brian. I said, you, you had a, what was wrong with that dream? He said, what dream, Daddy? I said, the dream you had, you were sitting up, you just kept looking. He didn't remember nothing that went on. Me and Max wife didn't bring that up again. We talked about it maybe later on in life, but uh, we never brought it up ever since that, man. But maybe, it was freaky. Like, talking about, as soon as I hit the light switch, it was like instance. And he turned, as soon as I hit the switch, and looked at me. And I bet, had a bad dream and started crying. Freaks me out, man. I don't know if you ever had anything like that happen with kids and stuff like that, but it's the only time it ever happened, but I'll never forget it. Anyway, thanks for listening to me, y'all, and uh, love your show. And I will become the EPP, man, because, man, I love your show. So take care. Hope you enjoyed the story. Stay wrong. I'm out. Take care. Thank you, Devon, for that story. When, when you have stuff like that, is that is that something paranormal, or is that just a really strong dream state that you think that he was in? Well, I mean, yeah, it certainly could have been. But the fact that they're watching The Ring, and that original Ring movie was really freaky. Yeah. And then you're watching that movie, and then that happens. Yeah, I'd be super panicky, too. Then you got to walk across the room to get the light to turn on, Mm -hmm. screaming at your kid the whole time. So part of it could have been elevated because they're watching the movie, but for the two things to happen at the same time, yeah, I'd be freaked out too. The timing of it's just just yeah. too much, you know, for it to... Uh, yeah. I thought it was interesting too, we were just talking about all the hair, and then boom, right into the call, and they're mentioning the ring, which the first thing you think of when you think of the ring is the girl with the hair. And it's, it's kind of one of those odd coincidences. Oh, that's right. Yeah, but that's just how this show works. I do not plan this shit out. It just all kind of transitions itself in a very creepy weird way (laughs) but uh yeah anyway uh 855-853-4802 our number one more call before we wrap it up hi hi my name is cuddy i'm a recent listener and a huge fan uh i wanted to share a story about a place that i used to work um up until a couple years ago i was a stripper and one night i saw the ghost of a fellow stripper. I was getting off stage 
and there's a little tiny hallway that really can only fit like two people um, that goes from the stage to the dressing room where we all get ready. And I was walking off and when I was doing that, there was a, another woman who was walking on stage and I'd never seen her before. She was absolutely gorgeous. She was tall, she was African-American, she had long black hair, gorgeous. So, you know, didn't really think much of it until I go sit down at a vanity and start fixing my makeup. And then I hear the DJ over the speaker call a different girl to the stage. And we only had one girl at a time up there. So I thought that was strange because there's nowhere else that this girl could have been going. The hallway leads right to the stage. So I thought that was strange. And then I don't know why, but something told me to turn around and look at the row of lockers that's in the dressing room for everyone to use. And as soon as I did, I noticed that taped to almost every single locker was a memorial picture of a girl that used to work there that died one night driving home in the rain from the club. And that picture was unmistakably of the the dancer that I just saw. And I just felt my hands start shaking. So I went outside and sat for a few minutes and one of the bouncers came out to smoke a cigarette. And I said, who is that girl on everyone's locker? And he explained who she was and it was very quiet. And then he just said, sometimes people say they've seen her. And then I just kind of stared at him to kind of communicate that I had seen her without actually having to say it. Um, so yeah, that's my story and I do plan to share more. Thanks. Bye. There you go. That would be. I love that one. That would be rather troubling. Very vivid. Very, you know, you, you, there's the woman that you, you know, you saw, you didn't think anything of it. Just normal. Okay. There they are. And then boom. Wait a second. Holy shit. Well, what I love about that is that you think of like the school marm who is uh, is now a ghost, or there was the uh, you know, there's like you just think of anybody but a stripper ghost, <laughs> and the fact that there are stripper ghosts, like I love that, I love it. It, it, it affects. I mean, this is not something that that's going to be discriminating in, in terms of like any sort of career or anything of that nature. It's just right. So you could have cashier. Yeah, ghosts. anywhere, any place. Doesn't matter who you are, what you do. It's this is a phenomena that that transcends everything. So yeah, like toll booth operator ghost. That seems like a given. Yeah, that, yeah. You know, guy working at Lowe's ghost. Like. Mm-hmm. It can happen. Yeah, of course, it, it can happen anywhere. I think sometimes what we see, it, it, I'm not necessarily attributing it to this one specifically, but the more that you, I think, love your job and, and your career, it seems the more likely it is that you're going to find the ghosts of those individuals there. We see that quite often in right. work in workplaces where it's like, and they spent their entire, you know, 40 year career there and, you know, they retired and they died the At next the day. Library. Yeah, but they're there still. So. But at the strip club, you know, I never heard of that, Mm -hmm. but it totally makes sense. But what's interesting to me is that she's just done performing. She's going back to back to the dressing area Mm -hmm. and just walk by this woman like she doesn't think anything about it. No. And those are the best ghost stories like that, where it's not like this moment of and this glowing woman came down the hall. It's just, hey, hey. And you keep going. And wait a second. That person's dead. You know, but you don't know it until you start kind of comparing some notes to find out that person's that doesn't yeah. make any sense. Yeah. yeah, but it can happen anywhere. Thanks for uh, for sharing that story with us. 855-853-4802 is our phone number here at Real Ghost Stories Online. And that's going to wrap up the program for today. If you like the show, sign up to be an EPP extra podcast person on our website at ghostpodcast.com or patreon.com slash real ghost stories five bucks a month gets you all the bonus material until next time for carol i'm tony bruski thanks for listening to real ghost stories online